Hello, good evening. Good evening, good evening Miss. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, this is the session number two. We are uh, in the first week, so we are like um, becoming familiar with the topics that we are developing in this first week. You know, that is like the introduction for um, this uh, course and also for these topics. You know that in this case, we are going to use like a more advanced topics because we are not just in basic a uh, part we are in a intermediate level so in this case we are like uh, trying to um be more um i can say that we are like practicing more in this case because we are changing the level of the activities that we are performing when we are talking in english so in this case we are like doing that part we are going to uh, focus on uh, the process or the acquisition of the language because in this case we need to, to practice more the um the listening, we are uh, going to try to practice uh, the speaking, and also we are going to practice the writing part, and we are going to learn more about the grammar uh, topics. So in some cases, we are not going to um, do some exercises. In, in some cases, we are just going to listen and to understand uh, different topics when we are talking about something about grammar, because I know that in some cases it's kind of complicated for us to uh, understand some grammatical topics because it's kind of uh, confusing sometimes. So in, some, in those cases, we are just going to pay attention and then we are going to practice some of the topics that we are uh, learning when we are uh, talking about grammar. Así que en este caso, cuando sean temas gramaticales, pues vamos a tratar de no detener la parte del, del learning process, sino que vamos a tratar de escuchar, de entender, ¿verdad? Esta parte de la gramática, que a veces es una de las partes que eh, nos da un poco de problemas eh, a la hora de, de practicar o de aprender el idioma. Eh, cuando sean eh, temas como de vocabulario, topics kind of relax, we are going to um, do more activities or exercises or games or whatever uh, things we are going to do. Because in that case, that is the point of the vocabulary. We are going to um, learn more words and also we are going to put into practice all the information that we are gaining with the vocabulary. But with grammar, it is um, important that we can understand better the information. And yesterday we were talking about the adverse of frequency in which we were making like a review. In this case, it's a short review about the advert of frequency in which we apply some uh, knowledge because we were talking about how often uh, we do or we exercise and we put into practice because you, can, you create some statements explaining your uh, schedules when you are uh, doing exercise. So in that case is like we can notice uh, the use of the adverbs that you can give. So in that case, you have the information. So in this case, it's just to apply that information in a statement. Okay, now we are going to um have two different things we are going to have a listening part in this case we're going to listen an explanation about pronunciation um it is more related to the intonation 
So in this case, we are going to put uh, attention to the explanation that we have on the video that we have on the platform uh, because it is related in the intonation that we give to the different words. And also I'm going to give a short um, explanation about another kind of intonation that we can give. In this case, it related to the way we pronounce the words uh, and how people can understand the words that we are saying through the different pronunciation or intonation that we have of the words. And it's kind of different when we are talking with our friends and we use like uh, in some cases, like a more, uh, we can say happy uh, voice because we are talking with people that we feel good and we don't feel ashamed to speak, to laugh, to uh, say some jokes or something like that. But when we are in our jobs, it's different because it is like a very serious tone. Um, the pronunciation is different also because we need to be more polite with people. Um, so in this case, we're going to listen first the uh, explanation of the intonation. We're going to go to the platform. Vamos a la plataforma a escuchar esta explicación sobre la entonación. Eh, ¿Cómo podemos nosotros entonar ciertas palabras? En este caso es intonation with direct address. Uh, we're going to listen what this information said, and then we are going to make like a a short um a short explanation about the the things of the video. So let's pay attention to the information. Uh, miss, no se escucha. Tell me. No se escucha, Miss. Okay, I'm going to share again. If we have problems, you can tell me. Let me see. Okay, I hope this time it's going to work. In this session, participants will listen to intonation with direct address. This helps sound natural when speaking. There is usually falling intonation and a pause before the name. You're really fit, Paul. She looks tired, James. I feel great, Dr. Lee. Remember to listen and practice as many times as needed. The pause before the name. You're really. F she looks tired. It helps sound natural when speaking. There is usually falling intonation and a pause before the name. You're really fit, Paul. She looks tired, James. I feel great, Dr. Lee. Remember to listen and practice as many times as needed. Okay, this one is just like a very short explanation about the pronunciation. And in this case, it's related to the intonation with direct address. And it says that there is like a pause and falling intonation uh, after, I mean, before a noun or before the name. Cuando tenemos el nombre de una persona, que en este caso, ¿verdad? Eh, ahí vemos los ejemplos. Cuando eh, tenemos nombres así como estos, vamos a hacer una entonación que en lugar de ir hacia arriba, va hacia abajo. Y también vamos a hacer una pausa antes del nombre. Así como lo vemos ahí con esa coma. You're really fit, Paul. Va en lugar de ir hacia arriba, va bajando. You're really fit, Paul. 
She looks tired, James. I feel great, Dr. Lee. So in this case, when we have this kind of uh, sentences or this kind of uh, statements, we are going to use uh, this kind of a uh, falling intonation. And these ones work um, because we need to sound more natural when we are uh, speaking in English. The thing is that when we are learning in some cases, uh, we are not going to use um, like a very kind of, a, I don't know, familiar voice, or we are not going to sound very confident when we're uh, talking in English. No siempre no vamos a sonar como muy uh, seguro, ¿verdad?, de nosotros mismos, porque en muchos de los casos tal vez estamos tratando de entender lo que estamos explicando o tratando de traducir en nuestra mente el mensaje que queremos darle a los otros. Entonces, vamos a sonar como muy eh, nerviosos, muy robotizados quizás en algunos casos, eh, pero si nosotros so... practicamos... Ajá, like that. But if we practice um, the different intonation, as I was saying, that we, uh, we change the tone of the voice when we are speaking with our friends, uh, when we are talking with our family, and also when we are talking with uh, someone that we don't know, it's completely different. And in this case, if we can practice this kind of pronunciation and we can uh, be very... Um, we can say like we are uh, thinking about this kind of pronunciation at the beginning, then you are going to find um, that it's not kind of complicated. You are going to do it naturally. Uh, at the beginning, it's very uh, confusing. It's very difficult. But then with the practice, you are going to be like very natural with this kind of pronunciation. And another thing that you need to uh, uh, have in your mind is that uh, all of the people have a different uh, intonation, have a different uh, way in which they pronounce the words. It is not like you are going to use the same pronunciation of the same, um, we are going to say it in Spanish. No vamos a utilizar la misma articulación de las palabras uh, because we are completely different and in my case, I make a lot of mistakes when I am talking in English, but um, that is something very funny. But I make a lot of mistakes when I am speaking in Spanish also. It is not just related to, to the language. It's like related with my brain because uh, I don't know why when I am speaking in a very fast way, um, I make a lot of mistakes because like, I don't know, tropiezo, me tropiezo mucho, ¿verdad? Cuando, cuando hablo. Entonces, a veces, esa, ese tropiezo que nosotros cometemos en español, puede que en inglés también lo sigamos cometiendo. Y no es porque tal vez no sepamos cómo se pronuncia una palabra o no sepamos eh, cómo decirla correctamente, sino que es porque en español también tenemos como esa, esa parte, ¿verdad? De algunos tropiezos, que se nos enreda la lengua, que no la pronunciamos como se debe, que hay algún sonido que no sale como corresponde, porque a veces eh, llegamos a unir dos sonidos, ¿verdad? De las consonantes, de las vocales, algún sonido, y lo seguimos haciendo en inglés. In that case, it's like you are not going to feel bad with that pronunciation that you have, because it is part of the way you speak in reality. So in that case, you need to, to focus on the different intonation that you are going to use, like in this case, when you are using intonation with a direct address. And also, it's um, important that you know that we have different words that we can pronounce like very different when we are speaking. Uh, for example, when we are using the word what, it's just a word, but it can change the pronunciation, the intonation, when we are like asking something that is very interesting. What, what is the, the, the ending? What is next? Or when we are angry, what, what? Or when we are like very surprised, what? We change the tone of the voice. Cambiamos el tono de la voz incluso para decir que sí. Sí, normal. Sí, cuando estamos muy emocionados. 
sí, que en realidad nosotros no lo sentimos como mm, muy así, pero cambia la voz, cambian los tonos y esto pasa con este, esta clase de entonaciones también. But we have something more about the, the intonation with direct address because we have another topic and in that case is related to a question. So we're going to change from this one to the document. So in the document, we are going to continue with the information related to this topic. But give me a second, I'm going to write the topic. Then we are going to listen another conversation. Vamos a escuchar otra conversación que tiene que ver con el segundo tema que vamos a desarrollar hoy. Okay, in this case, we're going to see more about the, the intonation, but in this case, it is related with the intonation of the word please. So in this case, we are going to put into practice Uh, the different ways in which we can say please. It is just a word, but depending on the situation, we can change the intonation of the word. So in this case, we are going to talk about intonation of, of please. This is the word. So in this case, We're going to see four different things. Vamos a ver cuatro cosas diferentes relacionadas a esta entonación. We are going to divide these parts into numbers. So we have number one, and it says, intonation of please. Hello, good evening. Welcome. Intonation of please depends on the position in the sentence. So in this case, when we are using the word please, we need to, to focus on the uh, position in which you are applying it, this word. So in that case, you are going to change a little bit the intonation of the word. Number two, at the beginning of the sentence, it is stressed. Cuando hablamos de que una palabra está estresada, en este caso no es que pues sea como nosotros los humanos, que nos estresamos en nuestro trabajo, sino que lleva una fuerza de voz mayor que la de otras palabras. Entonces, at the beginning, cuando está al principio de la oración, esta lleva como ese estrés, esa mayor fuerza de voz. But as a rule, it doesn't form a separate sense group. Como una regla, no eh, va a hacerse un grupo diferente, ¿verdad? Con esta eh, palabra, sino que simplemente va a ir al inicio de la oración. We have an example for this. And it says, please repeat the nouns three times. Please repeat the nouns three times. Ahí tenemos la pronunciación. Please empieza, please, pero al mismo tiempo va bajando. Please repeat the nouns three times. Now, number three, in the middle of the sentence, 
please can be stressed on under on a stress and it doesn't form a separate sense group. Cuando va en medio, puede ser de dos formas. O lleva estrés o no lleva estrés la palabra. Puede que no lleve esa fuerza de voz, ¿verdad? Se puede hacer de las dos formas igualmente. And we have the example. It says, would you please switch on the tape recorder? Can you please switch on the tape recorder? Or we can say, would you please switch on the tape recorder? Would you please? Or would you please? Podemos cambiar la forma en la que lo pronunciamos, ¿verdad? Una forma un poco más plana y una que vaya un poco más elevada, pero que también vaya bajando. Can you please switch on the tape recorder? Can you please switch on the tape recorder? And the last one, number four. It says, at the end of the sentence, please is on a stress. It doesn't form a separate group and it is pronounced with the melody of the previous group. Cuando va al final de la oración, no lleva estrés, o sea, va una, eh, un tono normal, pero lo que sí hace es seguir la melodía de la oración. Si en la melodía de la oración vamos subiendo y bajando, pues al finalizar, pues tenemos que ponerle esa esa forma, ¿verdad?, de pronunciar las palabras. Tiene que seguir la forma en la que nosotros ya estamos hablando. Si es una forma plana, pues va a seguir plano hasta el final. Si le ponemos un poco de tonos, ¿verdad?, diferentes, pues vamos a seguir poniéndole de esa manera. And we have the example. That is the last example of this topic. And it said, would you read louder, please? Would you read louder, please? Would you read louder, please? We can change the tone of the voice, but it depending on the way you are feeling at that moment. Okay, in this case, it's not like a very long topic. Okay, give me a second. Like this, I think it's better. Like this. Okay, in this case, we're just going to have uh, some kind of explanation about this topic, but it is not like we are going to focus on intonation or pronunciation. 
this is just like a, a preview of some topics that you need to, to develop in the future. In this case, when we are like uh, having kind of uh, long um, courses or you are like uh, very focusing on English courses, you are going to learn something about the pronunciation and intonation, but it's a different um, like, of course, because you need to, to practice a lot with the pronunciation and all of the things. In this case, it's just like uh, a couple of ideas related to, to this kind of topic. So in that case, don't worry about the, the topic of the pronunciation. It's just like to understand kind of better these kind of topics. Now, we are going to... We are going to listen another conversation, but in this case, we are going to uh, learn something about the use of a specific word uh, that we are going to use it for creating questions. But in this case, we're going to see the video on the platform. So give me a moment. I'm going to change from this um, screen to other. So give me a second. Okay, we are going to see this conversation that is called, I am a real freak, fitness freak. It's related also with the topic that we were developing yesterday in which we were talking about um, the exercise. So in this case, it is uh, called, I am a real fitness freak. So let's pay attention to the conversation and also on the phrases that we are going to listen in this conversation. In this class, you will listen and follow a conversation about physical skills. Hi everyone. Are you ready to listen to another conversation? This time we will learn to ask questions using how. Listen and repeat. I'm a real fitness freak. You're in great shape, Keith. Thanks. I guess I'm a real fitness freak. How often do you work out? Well, I do aerobics twice a week, and I play tennis every week. Tennis? That sounds like a lot of fun. Oh. Do you want to play sometime? Uh, how well do you play? Pretty well, I guess. Well, all right, but I'm not very good. No problem. I'll give you a few tips. I guess I'm okay. In this case, we have this conversation, and it's kind of different from the first one. On the first one, we have two people that is talking about um uh, one of these a, a person is like doing some exercise, and the other one is a couch potato. When she had time, she likes to stay in the sofa and watch some TV. In this case, we're talking about that if someone is like, uh, that uh, this guy really like to do exercise in this case. That's why it's called a fitness freak. But in this case, we have uh, the uh, statements. You are in great shape, Kate. Thanks, I guess I'm a real fitness freak. How often, in this case, we have this question. How often do you work out? ¿Qué tan seguido haces ejercicio o te ejercitas? But the structure of this question is one of the things that we are going to pay attention because we are going to talk about something related to, to that question. Well, I do aerobics twice a week and I play tennis every week. Dice que hace aeróbicos dos veces a la semana y juega tenis toda la semana. Tennis, that sounds like a lot of fun. 
tennis suena como algo muy divertido. Oh, do you want to play some time? ¿Te gustaría jugar alguna vez? Um, how well? Another question. How well do you play? ¿Qué tan bien juegas? Pretty well, I guess. Bastante bien, creo. Well, all right, but I am not very good. Bien, está, bueno, está bien, pero no soy muy buena. No problem. I will give you a few tips. Te voy a dar un par de eh, consejos, ¿verdad? Para que ella pueda jugar bien lo que es el tenis. But in this conversation, we have uh, two uh, questions that we need to uh, like think about. We have the how often do you work out? And also, how well do you play? But why we need to pay attention to those questions? Well, the thing is that we are going to talk about the word how. We are going to learn how to use the word how and in which situations we are going to use this word. Sabemos que tenemos diferentes eh, palabras para crear eh, preguntas. Una de esas es el how. Ahora vamos a enfocarnos en how y también en qué eh, contextos o de qué formas podemos utilizar el how. In, in this case, it's like you are going to tell me, oh, it's uh, pretty easy because you know that you are going to say, um, how do you feel today? ¿Cómo te sientes hoy? Porque obviamente cuando traducimos la palabra, se traduce como eh, exactamente cómo. But in this case, we're going to see different elements that we need to eh, pay attention to and put into practice. Así que vamos a ver bastantes elementos eh, que podemos utilizar con el how. So I'm going to stop this one. So give me a moment. I'm going to change from this to the other. That is the, the topic number two. So in this case, we're going to develop this topic. How? In this case, we know that this where it's considered an adverb. And it says the adverb how most commonly means in what way or to what extent. En este caso, se refiere, ¿verdad? A qué significado de esta palabra es, de qué manera, ¿verdad? En este caso, nosotros podemos decir eh, que la palabra how se refiere a cómo se realizan las cosas, ¿verdad? Como podemos uh, decir... Mm, una explicación paso a paso de cómo hacer algo o de, de cómo llegar a un lugar, ¿verdad? So, in that case, what way or what extent? So, in this case, the first thing is how in questions. ¿Cómo aplicamos el how en las preguntas? We use how when we introduce direct and indirect questions. Cuando utilizamos las preguntas directas y las preguntas indirectas. En este caso es básicamente por la posición de el how. En cláusulas o en pequeñas partes, ¿verdad? De la oración. So, in this case, we have uh, different examples. In this case, we have the first one. I haven't seen you for age. How are you?
En esta pregunta ustedes pueden eh, notar que no estamos haciendo la pregunta al inicio, sino que le estamos haciendo un comentario antes donde dice, I haven't seen you for age. No te he visto en años. Then we ask the question, how are you? ¿Cómo estás? So in that case, it is not like the first part of the statement. It is in the second part. Then we have another one. How was the film? This is the first part of the statement. How was the film? Was it bad as you thought? Miss, excuse me. It's a little bit difficult to me to read the, the sentences. Can you? up the this light I don't know is this light or, or what is it you can see the letters because they are like smaller or if you can see the whole thing the statements or um I don't know I, I can all of them means all of them all of them Ok, this is a document. Este es un documento en línea. Eh, el que estoy presentando. No sé si es porque la letra es muy pequeña o porque en realidad no se ve bien las oraciones. Yo puedo hacer un poco más grande las letras. O you was, hacer... you was, yes, miss, but you was uh, talking about the first one. I haven't seen you in age, but we, we couldn't uh, see when you are saying the, the, the sentences. You can see the second sentence. So let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Like this. Give me a second. And I'm going to maintain this one like this. It's better now. Thank you, man. You're welcome. So in this case, in the second statement, you can see that we ask the question as the first thing we are going to do. Uh, it is not like we are going to make the, the, or say the idea and then the question. In this case, we are asking the question first and then we make another question that is related to the first thing. How was the film? ¿Cómo estuvo la película? Was it bad as, as you thought? Estuvo tan mala como tú creíste? So in this case, we are going to add the question with the word how at the beginning. Then we can apply more information or we can ask another question related to the information that we are asking in the first part. But in the first statement, we are making like a comment and then we are like making the question. So it's kind of different in this case. Now we are going to see another example and we have the word how in the middle of the statement. Vamos a poner la oración en medio de I mean, vamos a poner la palabra how en medio de la oración. No va al principio, no va al final, sino que vamos a ponerla en medio. We are going to begin the question with the auxiliary do. Do you know? How can I get to the bus station? How can I get to the bus station? ¿Sabes cómo puedo llegar a la estación del bus? Then we have another one, but in this case it's not a question. It is an answer. Esta es una, pre una respuesta. I ask her, but in this case it's not like a answer. It's, like, it's just like a statement. Es solo una afirmación. I asked her how she was, but she didn't answer me. I asked her how she was, 
but she didn't answer me. Le pregunté cómo estaba, pero ella no me respondió. So, in this case, we can see that um, we can apply this how in different positions in a statement. We can do it at the end with a question. We can do it at the beginning of the question. Then we can apply this information in the middle of the statement as we, we have on the question and when we have the, um, the affirmation in this case. Así que no simplemente vamos a aplicar el how al principio de nuestras oraciones. Podemos hacer dos cláusulas, como lo tenemos en el primer ejemplo, donde aplicamos una información, luego punto, y hacemos la pregunta. Como en el número dos, Empezamos con la pregunta con la WH word, que es how, y luego agregamos más información en la segunda parte. Y después agregamos eh, al medio de la oración, do you know how? ¿Sabes cómo puedo llegar a? En este caso, how is not like uh, the word that we are using for the question, because in that case we have the auxiliary. But it is related to asking specific information. Then in the number four, it's of an affirmation and it says, I asked her how. Le pregunté cómo estaba. No es una pregunta, sino que estamos hablando específicamente de qué fue lo que le preguntamos a esa persona. Ahora, tenemos otro tipo. And in this case, it says, we use how to introduce questions about measurements or amounts. Aquí hablamos de introducir preguntas acerca de cantidades o de tamaños, ¿verdad? Ese tipo de información. So in this case, we have examples also related to, to this part. In this case, we are talking about the age in the first one. And it says, how old is your grandfather? How old is your grandfather? ¿Cuál es la edad, verdad? de tu abuelo. En este caso podríamos decirlo que tan viejo está, pero nos referimos a la edad. How often do you get to your cottage at weekends? How often? Esta pregunta ya la hemos visto. How often? Estamos hablando de eh, de qué tan seguido nosotros hacemos una actividad. Do you get At weekends. How much does the average DVD player cost these days? Aquí hablamos de dinero. How much does the average DVD player cost these days. Estamos preguntando sobre el precio, el costo de una cosa. And then, how far? Estamos hablando de la distancia de un lugar a otro. How far is it to the Prado? No se puede ver. And how long will it take to get there by taxi?
So in this case, it's related to uh, the distance from one place to another. How far is it to the Prado and how long will it take us to get there by taxi? ¿Qué tan lejos está el Prado? Que este es un museo, ¿verdad? Y una eh, galería de arte que se encuentra en Madrid. Y que eh, tanto tiempo nos eh, costaría, ¿verdad? Este, para llegar ahí en taxi. Es como preguntar sobre direcciones, ¿verdad? ¿Cuánto tiempo nos tardaríamos en hacer el recorrido hacia ese lugar? Now, we can use this uh, WH word to create exclamations. Podemos utilizarlo para exclamaciones. So, we're going to see how to create these statements or how, um, what are the different uh, statements that we can use to make these exclamations. In exclamations, we uh, use how before adjectives, adverbs, and verb phrase. In verb phrase, the word order is the subject plus verb. En este caso, vamos a utilizar el how con ya sea adjetivos, con adverbios, o con eh, frases que contengan el verbo, ¿verdad? Las verb phrase. En el caso de las verb phrase, vamos a utilizar el orden de las palabras donde va primero el sujeto, y luego el verbo. Okay, in this case, we have a couple of examples. So in this case, we're going to put this one. And we have the first one and it says, Dave, above, here are some flowers. Perdón, Tell me. Una preguntita. Eh, cuando dice después de adjetivos, adverbios, And verb phrase, ¿qué significa eso? El verb phrase es cuando están utilizando un verbo, pero que lleva un complemento y van juntos. Y tienen ah. un significado diferente. O sea, tenemos el verbo, que es una acción, pero cuando se utiliza, digamos, son dos palabras juntas, eh, se le cambia el significado de, esas, uh, de, esa, de ese verbo cuando ya okay, va junto gracias. con esa palabra. Uh -huh. Thank you. You're welcome. So, in this case, we have these examples. They, they've both, here's some flowers. How nice, how nice of them. How fantastic. How beautiful they sang. En este caso, como estamos hablando de, eh, de exclamaciones, o sea, son eh, oraciones que nos hacen una exclamación, algo increíble. En este caso lo vamos a utilizar de esta forma. Vamos a utilizar el how con algún adjetivo, con algún adverb. Y lo vamos a poner de esta forma, así como aparece ahí. How nice of them. Qué bueno por ellos. How fantastic. Qué fantástico, increíble. How beautiful they sang. Eh, qué bonito cantan. En ese caso no es, no es como decir como de bonito, sino que es una traducción un poco diferente, ¿verdad? Nosotros le damos el sentido a esas traducciones para llegar al sentimiento de lo que están tratando de decir en este tipo de oraciones. 
And in this case, we have um, different like uh, expressions that we can use also with this how questions or this how word, because you can see in this case that it is not just related to questions. A veces solo pensamos en preguntas cuando vemos la palabra how, pero también vemos que se refiere a oraciones, ¿verdad? Que tienen que ver con explicar algo eh, específico, no solo con las preguntas. Miss, Tell me. En este caso sería, eh, como usted dice, ¿verdad? No puede decir cómo de bonito, uh -huh. sino que se cambia como otro concepto de decir qué. Y en este caso, como nosotros le vamos Pero a... Pero no que de pregunta, sino que no, solo exactamente. como... Exactamente. Okay. En este caso, si nosotros... Eh, es que ese es el, el, como el sentido. Cuando nosotros estamos aprendiendo inglés, a veces nos eh, hacemos como las traducciones bien literales, ¿verdad? En este caso, cuando dice, how fantastic. Eh, cuando nos dice a, nos, a nosotros en una primera vez que nosotros aprendemos quizás inglés, nos dicen, ¿cómo se traduce esta oración? Y uno dice, how es como, fantastic, fantástico, como fantástico, but in that case, it don't have any sense, no hay como un, uh, no hay un sentido para esa oración. Entonces, aquí nosotros le vamos cambiando y ya no se traduce a cómo, sino a qué, pero ¿qué tipo de qué? de afirmación, no yeah, de pregunta. Miss, uh, sorry, you said related. I don't know what is the meaning of the word. Related, uh, parecido. Related. Uh -huh. Okay, and can you give us uh, one example using verb phrase? A verb phrase. Please. Okay, we are going to write some uh, uh, statements with verb phrase, but first, I'm going to like make a, vamos a hacer como una pequeña pausa para entender un poco esto de los verb phrase, porque eh, son como uniones que se hacen. En este caso son como uh, verbos que ya van unidos a otras cosas, eh, que es la combinación. En este caso, el verb phrase es la combinación de un auxiliar, que los auxiliares ustedes ya saben que pues, en este caso puede ser el do, el did, el verbo to be, también funciona como auxiliar. Y eh, que pues se le conoce también como un helping verb, porque nos está ayudando a ciertas estructuras, ¿verdad? En este caso. Y el verbo principal. Vamos a enfocarnos en el auxiliary verb y el main verb. Vamos a utilizarlo por acá. Sorry. Tell me. Verb phrase is the same phrase and verb. What kind of verbs? Uh, phrase and verbs. I can listen. No. And I, uh, is the other. Uh, the verb phrase is the union. Es la unión entre un auxiliary, un verbo auxiliar, y un verbo principal. Es como la cuestión de la experiencia verbal en español. Estás comiendo. Exactamente. Exactamente like that. En este caso, tenemos por aquí eh, the two things, auxiliary verb, the auxiliary verb plus the main verb. Aquí tenemos esas dos cosas importantes, que es básicamente lo que vamos a necesitar. En este caso, así como él lo decía, eh, vamos a utilizar el verbo to be, también podemos utilizar otros auxiliares como should, como has and had, y otros auxiliares. Pero vamos a enfocarnos tal vez en estos que son un poco más sencillos, en el has y en el have, y en el verbo to be. Hacemos una oración y ponemos el sujeto, my mom. Este es mi sujeto, my mom. Ahora voy a utilizar un auxiliar y un verbo principal. Pero este verbo principal... Yo lo voy a poner, en este caso, yo lo voy a utilizar con el ING, con el ING. My mom is cooking. Mi mamá, ¿qué está haciendo? Está cocinando. Está, is cooking, cocinando. My favorite, my favorite dish. I mean, this one is not like this. Favorite. 
Ahora, estos dos de acá, is cooking, va a funcionar como mi eh, verb phrase. Verb phrase es porque llevamos una frase, ¿verdad? Is cooking, está cocinando. Si yo le quito my mom en my favorite dish, solo lo dejo, está cocinando. Y puede funcionar como una oración. Sí, puede funcionar como una oración que gramaticalmente no va a estar correcta porque no lleva los otros elementos. En español no es así. En español nosotros decimos, está planchando, está cocinando, está leyendo. Y nosotros atribuimos... Está amaneciendo. Exactamente. Y nosotros le atribuimos el sujeto. En inglés es diferente. En inglés nosotros sí o sí tenemos que poner un sujeto, que es el que realiza la acción. Ahora, sí existen dos cosas eh, que tal vez ustedes ya las vieron en otros cursos o lo van a ver en otros cursos más adelante, que es la parte del passive and active voice. La voz pasiva y la voz activa. ¿Dónde? En algunos de los casos no se incluye el uh, sujeto porque o ya hablamos de ese sujeto en la conversación o porque en realidad no es relevante para nuestra oración. Pero en esos casos es que no vamos a utilizar un sujeto como en español. Pero en este caso sí. Básicamente el verb phrase es agregarle un auxiliar a un verbo principal. Y eso es. A veces suena completamente monstruoso y diferente pero es esta combinación de un verbo, de un auxiliar con un verbo principal. Que sí, en muchos de los casos puede cambiar su forma el verbo, porque en este caso no es un verbo uh, en su forma base, porque si no diría, my mom is cook, my favorite dish. No tiene sentido, porque a la hora de traducirlo diría, mi madre está, cocina, mi plato favorito. Entonces, hay que cambiarle ciertos elementos al verbo. También eh, se le puede poner en pasado, pero en pasado participio, que es como la última lista. Ustedes han visto las listas de verbos. Cuando ustedes van a hablar de verbos regulares e irregulares, tenemos verb, past, and past participle. Entonces, a veces se utiliza la última de las líneas, que es el past participle, para hacer estos eh, ejemplos. También se utiliza el been, have been, y el verbo en ing. Pero es como el uso del auxiliar con un eh, member, o con un verbo eh, principal. And that's it. Y se usan juntos, para que tengan como un sentido. Y esa es la, la, la parte. O sea que el sujeto nunca va tácito en inglés. En mm, some cases. Más que todo cuando estamos utilizando voz pasiva y activa. Ahí sí puede ir tácito. Porque en algunos casos, eh, tal vez yo ya hablé de ese sujeto. Eh, sí, es parte del present continuous. Porque aquí lo vemos en present continuous con el ING. Pero también es, es parte de, del uso del auxiliar con el verbo. En el caso de que, digamos, yo les estoy contando, Rodrigo compró una casa nueva. Y yo ya les conté, ¿verdad? Que Rodrigo compró la casa nueva. Y más adelante yo les digo, pero mmm, no gastó el dinero suficiente para los muebles. ¿De quién les estoy hablando yo? De Rodrigo. Rodrigo es mi sujeto y como yo ya lo mencioné eh, antes, en mi nueva oración ya Rodrigo no, no va a aparecer en la oración. Ahí sí yo la puedo poner tácita porque yo ya di información sobre Rodrigo. O a veces cuando yo no sé en realidad quién fue el que hizo la acción, ahí no necesito mencionarlo. Pero sí voy a utilizar una estructura específica para ese tipo de oraciones. Por eso les digo, no sé si ya vieron un poco sobre... Eh, el passive en active voice, o lo van a ver más adelante, o si no, vamos a hacer un pequeño eh, repaso de esa parte, porque sí es importante para eso del, del tácito, o de poner o no poner los sujetos. So, in this case, remember that we are uh, beginning the session um, five, five minutes uh, after the hour, I mean, before the hour, I, I guess. Eh, estamos comenzando, ¿verdad? Nuestra sesión cinco minutos antes de la hora para terminar a esta hora específicamente, que son las eh, 8.55. So, 
we are going to end the session here. Have a really good night. And we are going to discuss more about this kind of topics tomorrow. So have a really good night and see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night.